So when we looked at oscillations, we looked at free oscillations, we looked at damp damping, and we also looked at forced oscillations. And we said that this throws this topic throws up a few interesting things. So let's get back to this and let's start with just the first example of a forced oscillation that we looked at. So you can see here that the pushing a child on the swing is a forced oscillation. The child on the swing is the, oscill is the forced oscillator and the person pushing is providing the periodic force. Well, there's more to this than meets the eye. Let's suppose that the natural frequency of the child on the swing was for example, one hertz that could have unlikely, but that could be the value about one swing every second. Why not? Sounds fairly reasonable for a child on a swing. So in other words, that's the frequency which the swing would automatically just on its own oscillate at if we pushed it and then left it alone. One complete cycle every second. Well, if we now try and look physics wise at what the person is doing we can try and establish well what is the driving frequency what is the frequency with which the person is pushing the swing and we quickly see oh well yeah hang on that we're pushing the swing and we know this because we do it we push once every cycle so we actually push with the frequency which is equal to the natural frequency so if the natural frequency is one, per, one swing per second, then we're going to push with one push per second because we know that without thinking of any physics, we do that, we just go up and we push the kid just every time they're on their way down, we give a push. And intuitively, we know that's what we have to do in order to maintain a, a big or increase the swing to get the swing nice and big and keep it going. Well, this is actually an example of what we call resonance. And, um, and resonance occurs where in any driven system, in any driven oscillator, when the condition is met, that is being met in this case of pushing a child on a swing, when the driving frequency is equal to the natural frequency. We can see that there are several things going on in terms of energy. When we push the child on the swing, we choose the moment when we push. We push when the child is on their way down, probably just we sort of grab onto the swing, but we actually apply the force as the, as the child is moving through the equilibrium position, more or less. Because we know that if we add energy there, we basically increase the kinetic energy of the swing. So we're adding a little bit of a push every time the child goes down through equilibrium and initially because we do that the amplitude gets bigger and bigger and um, but of course if we just keep adding energy like that well uh, it depends as long as we don't add a huge amount eventually we're just going to keep and maintain the swing at a certain particular level of our choosing and we do this by just adding enough energy to counteract what's being lost through damping and through friction. So there's a kind of equilibrium going on. So energy is transferred to the oscillator once per cycle. And let's suppose we add the same amount of energy every cycle. And energy is being lost due to damping all the time. So basically, when uh, the, the amplitude is going to increase until the amount of energy being lost through damping over a cycle is equal to the amount of energy being added each cycle by the driving force. So this is a description of this interesting phenomenon called resonance, but it's far reaching and it's a little bit more you need to know about how it works. So let's have a look at a more kind of scientific example, uh, rather than pushing your sister or whoever on a swing. Well, this uh, we've also seen before an example looking a bit like this. And so we've got a vibrator which is providing a driving force, a periodic driving force. So what's happening there is the vibrator is oscillating upwards and downwards. And now we can see that um, if, uh, if 
it's on its way up, it's going to kind of pull the spring and upwards. And if it's on the way down, it's kind of going to push it downwards. And it's continually doing this. Well, attached to the spring, we've got a mass. And the big question is, you know, what will be the amplitude of oscillation of the mass? And how does it depend on the frequency of the, of the vibrator? Well, let's draw a graph to show you that and see if we know any of the points on this graph already. Well, we can imagine a really small driving frequency. Yeah, so like maybe just one oscillation every 10 seconds or something like that. So in other words, the vibrator is going very slowly down and then very slowly up and then very slowly down and then very slowly up. So slowly uh, that we are saying that we're right down kind of at this end of the frequency. We're tending towards a frequency of zero. Obviously, you can't, doesn't mean anything to have a frequency of zero, but we're right down, very, very low frequency, almost effectively zero. Well, what that would mean, what does that mean would happen to the, to the oscillation of the mass? Well, you can kind of visualise it. I mean, if this just creeps down very, very slowly, then the whole spring is going to creep down very, very slowly, and the mass will just drop down very, very slowly. And then... Five seconds later, it's on its way up very, very slowly. It's pulling everything very slowly and the mass goes up very slowly. So actually the whole kind of object will just do the same as the vibrator. You know, the mass will actually have an identical amplitude to the vibrator because as the vibrator drops down slowly, the whole thing moves down. And as it moves up, the whole thing moves up. So actually we know that at very low driving frequency, we've got a point right down here, where the amplitude of the oscillation of the mass is equal to the amplitude of the oscillation of the vibrator. Well, let's now look at the other extreme. Let's imagine an extremely rapid vibration now. So in other words, you know, 100 hertz, you know, so it's up and down 100 times a second. Well, we can fairly see that things are going to be a bit different this time, because the vibrator is going so fast, zzz, up and down, that the spring just doesn't have time to respond. You know, the, this top edge of the spring, this top loop of the spring will obviously oscillate, but the rest, the mass will stay still because before you know it, before the spring has moved up, it's on its way back down again. And uh, the mass hasn't had time to respond. It's got too much inertia. Uh, so actually, interestingly, we'll have actually an amplitude tending towards zero at very, very high driving frequency. So I can put that point tending towards the axis there. Do we know any other points? Well, yes, we do, because we can relate this to the example of the child on a swing. It's clear that we need to be pulling the mass upwards once every cycle, just as it's kind of on its way through the equilibrium on the way up we want to add kinetic energy to it once per cycle. So just like the child on the swing, we know that we're going to get the best possible build-up of amplitude by matching the frequency of the vibrator to the natural frequency of the system. So there's going to be a kind of best possible point um, somewhere up here, where just like with the child on the swing, we, the two frequencies are matched. And I might sort of draw a nice kind of curve, uh, something like this. And that's actually called a resonance curve. And the very key thing here, is, and it's a very important graph, and the key thing is that the peak of that curve, you get maximum amplitude when the driving frequency or forcing frequency is equal to the natural frequency. And if, if you're not sure, just visualise that child on a swing. Think what that means. And try and visualise this experiment. And you'll soon see why it makes sense. You know, if we had a frequency which was, say, double the natural frequency, if the driving frequency was double the natural frequency, then it would be pulling up when the mass was on its way up, but then it would push down 
when the mass was still on its way up because it's good. so it's so it's kind of cancelled out so the work done kind of accelerating the mass is then going to be cancelled out by some work done decelerating the mass it's just not going to work but uh, if we just match those frequencies we get this uh, very very important shape we should also notice here that we we've taken into account the fact that there will be damping if there wasn't damping then the amplitude would just build up and build up and build up until the system broke. The spring would break or the masses would fly off or the vibrator would break. Um, so what's, and sometimes those kind of things happen as we'll look at later. But we'll assume here that it just reaches a kind of equilibrium that, like we described earlier, where eventually the amount of energy lost by damping is equal to the amount being added each cycle. And that point hopefully will come about because remember that as the mass goes faster, there's going to be more drag, more air resistance, more, more resistance. So, um, so it makes sense that as the amplitude gets bigger, then the, the, drag, the fr frictional force becomes bigger, the damping becomes bigger. So hopefully we will reach that equilibrium point where as much energy, because the amount of energy being added is constant, but where the same amount of energy is is being removed by damping as is being added by the driving force. The amount of damping is pretty significant for um, resonating systems. If I, if I just show you this graph, you can see here there's a number of different resonance curves depending on the amount of damping. We looked at something in the last um, description we looked at something which was lightly damped, which had a resonance curve looking kind of like the blue line there. Like we decided, if there was no damping and the system was undamped, then, well, the amplitude would just tend to infinity. Of course, in a real system, the system would break before that was possible, or something would go wrong. You can imagine pushing a child on a swing. Well, if you push with sufficient force, then, and kept adding energy bigger than the damping can ever reach, then the, the car would go right over loop the loop <laughs> and hopefully be fine. But the system, as it were, would have broken down. It wouldn't anymore be the kind of oscillation that we're expecting. And um, all, all oscillating systems have a breakdown point. One thing to notice is that the heavily damped and very heavily damped examples have peaks which are slightly to the, to the left of um, our natural frequency line. Well, that's not because the, it, the driving frequency doesn't match the natural frequency. It's rather because for heavily damped systems, the natural frequency is slightly lower or significantly lower if it's very heavily damped than the natural frequency of an undamped or lightly damped system. Uh, now, that kind of makes sense. If you have something oscillating in water instead of in air, then you can imagine that its natural frequency is likely to be lower. And therefore, the driving frequency would need to match um, a, a lower frequency in order to get resonance. So it's worth noting that for heavy damp systems, the peak moves slightly to the left. But that's an important graph to, to know for um, this topic.